The omnipresence of God is a fact. God's arm is long. You can't run from him. Now in verses 13 through 18, we see his omnipotence. So far, we've seen his omniscience, his all-knowing nature. In the second stanza, we've seen his omnipresence. And then in the third, we see his omnipotence. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. When we think of the um, omnipotence of God, the fact that he's all-powerful, maybe the first thing that comes to mind is God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. We think of the huge cosmic things, galaxies and stars and planets and comets and things like that. But we oftentimes, when we think of the power of God, we don't think of the small things, but think of atomic power just to split an atom, how much energy is released. That atom was put together by the power of God and everything in the universe. So from the cosmic to the atomic level, God's power is present and real. But what better way to understand the all-powerful nature of God than to examine yourself and realize that every atom was put together by God's power. Your very spirit and your soul all that you are and your, your mind and your heart. We are completely surrounded by the omnipotence of God on just a personal level that we can't even understand that, let alone the omnipotence of God in the cosmic realm. But notice as he ended talking about being in darkness, then he goes straight into this stanza where it's one of the dark places, the womb. In the womb, where nobody sees. And we think we understand, but we are so far away with our scientific minds. We're still like cavemen, banging bones together, trying to get it. God has woven your whole life together physically and spiritually, for his glory. Everything that he's done in you, from the hair on your heads down to the toenails on your big toe, or toenail on your big toe, little toes, is for his glory. Your personality, which you might not like, but God's like, hey, don't mess with it. You're exactly the way I made you. Why? For my glory, he says. Not for your glory. For his glory. And he's established everything in our lives and put everything in order in such a way that we might reach out for him and seek him. As it says in Acts 17, verse 26 and 27, I'll just summarize it, that, you know, he, he from one man, made every nation of men and determine the exact places that they should live and the times so that they would seek God and perhaps find him. Everything in your life is ordered in such a way as to glorify God and have you seek the Lord. In verse 14, when you realize everything about you has been woven together by the master craftsman, Verse 14 can legitimately be translated, for I am awesomely wonderful. Now, it's 
It's probably good we don't translate it that way because most people would take that the wrong way. But if you say I'm awesomely wonderful in the sense of I'm one of God's works, that's the context. You have such great value and worth in the eyes of God in the way that he made you. And you, as God's children, are called his treasure. Now, thanking God for the wonder of yourself is an okay thing. Now, we are nothing, the Bible says. We're just dust. We're just like drops in the bucket of the sea of the nations. I mean, it's really humbling when you look at it, but God made you perfectly and intricately and he died for you. There's something about the Lord that's amazing and that he can take something worthless and make it a treasure worth more than you could ever imagine. Now in verse 15 where it talks about the depths of the earth, it's a metaphor for the womb. We're still speaking of this deepest concealment within the mother's womb. It also says the word intricately woven. We've already seen that he has knitted us together and now we're intricately woven, which refers to a complex pattern of colors of the weaver or embroiderer. And so if you've ever seen a tapestry before, the backside of a tapestry is really strange looking. You ever notice that? Little strings hanging off, and you can't really see much of a pattern, just a lot of mess. Looks like a complete mess. But if you are on the other side of it, and you get that perspective to see what God is doing, you see a beautiful piece of art. That is so much our lives. We're on the side that's a mess, trying to understand it and look at it, but then you look at how God's woven us together, And from day one of our lives, not only our personalities, our our physical bodies, every day that he's ordained for us, but if you look at it from his perspective, it's amazing. Sometimes you just have to trust that. Now, as it goes on there uh, and speaks of the days of our lives ordained before us, it could also be translated to actually speak of embryonic members not being known but planned out before they're even developed. Each part of the embryo as it forms. And if you've ever looked at an embryo, it looks really weird. Very strange looking, like alien almost. But as that baby forms, You know, God knows each and every little part of that embryo and what it's going to look like and what he's got planned for every body part, always for his glory. In verses 17 through 18, notice this. It says, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God, How vast the sum of them. If I would count them, they're more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Now remember the context of what we're talking about. God's thoughts and his plan and everything working together and knitting you together. It's all about his omnipotence in your life, personally. Verse 17 through 18 that we just read moves from our own thoughts about God to God's infinite thoughts about us. That's crazy to think about when you think that God thinks about you with his infinite omniscience, omnipresence, and um, um, all-powerful nature. He thinks about you with infinite detail, even when you're not thinking about him. That's cool. That's the grace of God. That we could be such brats sometimes in our life. We could be so self-centered or occupied, and yet God is always occupied with you. 
I like how the NLT translates this because, again, in context, and it can be translated this way, how precious are your thoughts about me, O God? They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of the sand, and when I wake up, you're still with me. What does that tell us? That even when we're asleep and we're dreaming, you know, I don't know about you guys, but my dreams are weird sometimes, you know. Weird dreams. Sometimes scary dreams and, and uh, no dreams, whatever it is. But you wake up and you open your eyes and God has been thinking about you and watching you breathe and sleep just like parents watch their kids and they listen to the breath and they smell that sweet baby smell in the room. God watches us and he thinks about us. I don't think that ever goes away for the Lord towards us. Kids grow up and they get to be stinky teenagers. You know, you walk in the room and you're like, oh my goodness, wow. Man. Maybe you don't look so pretty when you sleep. But God's watching. Now this idea of waking up can also refer to the resurrection. No matter what happens in your life, God's right there. He'll always be with you. He will never leave you. Now the last thing that I want to look at here is God's holiness in me or you. God's holiness in our life. In verses 19 through 24, now this is like, Maybe it sounds like a screeching record or a nails against a chalkboard. When you read verse 19 through 22, and it says, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. You know, not too many people are like, Yeah! I didn't hear any amens out there. <laughs> oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. We see God's holiness now working in the life of this psalmist, David, as he's pondering how awesome God is, how all these parts of who God is is at work in his life personally, and he's ignited with zeal. To the point where he's like, you know what? If somebody's not cool with God, I'm not cool with them. When I used to play football, believe it or not, I was a tackle. 150 pound tackle. <laughs> but I had massive Neanderthal legs. And so I was going up against guys like 300 pounds. But besides getting beat up all the time, um, one of the things I used to do to get myself riled up, you know, to get excited and, and do well in the game was I'd be like, okay, that dude right there just hit on my girlfriend. <laughs> Ooh, you jerk. You know, I'm thinking about this in my mind. I get all upset and then, hike, boof, you know. <laughs> drive, 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 you know. If you've ever been a lineman, you know. But uh, there's something that, is motivating about that when you realize you love somebody so much or, you know, or the other thing I used to think is this dude messed with my mom. <laughs> he said something about my mom and I would like work it up in my head and I would get all, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so the psalmist is kind of like that with the Lord right now. He's so pumped about God. He's so in love with the Lord and then he thinks about those who say blasphemous things, that worship other gods, that are one day, as you read through the, all of Scripture, there will be a day when the armies of the earth gather against Christ as he returns. And they will want to destroy the Lord. But we know that that doesn't end up that way. Now, there's a real good chance when the Lord's coming back, we are part of that army. It's with the Lord, that is. And this might be the cry of our hearts. 
The enemies of the Lord are my enemies. But for now, that is not the age we live in. For now, we see that Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. That we are given the job to preach the gospel to the world and to the enemies of God. So I find it really interesting that here as you see the holiness of God become a passion of the life of David and how he responds to wickedness, then he goes from responding in a powerful way against wicked people and then he turns to his own heart and he says, is there any wickedness in me? Which is kind of the right response. Look in verses 23 and 24. We see this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. He goes from being so passionate, he's inspired to want to fight for the Lord. He want, he's so loyal to God. He says, your enemies are my enemies. But now he's like, you know what? If I am an enemy, if I'm messed up somehow, Lord, search my heart. He kind of comes full circle. When at the beginning, when he thinks about God knowing everything about him and perhaps he thinks of running away, it's too much for me. If I go as far as the east or the west, I can't escape you. He comes to this place now and he's like, okay, Lord, I surrender. Search my heart. He falls on his knees and he realizes that he might be the sinner. And what does he want? He just wants to be right with the Lord. If you always attack the evil around you without dealing with the evil inside of you, that's not a good place to be. The Pharisees were in that place and they missed Christ. Bummer. Be holy as I am holy, God says, but he also says be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. That's how we deal with folks in our life. But we need to be real about where we're at in our own life. Be cautious when you're examining yourself. You really need the Lord to examine you because if you look at yourself, you only see the things that are good. You try to justify yourself. Well, you know, I said that and I do those things. No, it's because of this. There's a reason, you know. It's okay for me. But if somebody else does it, you're like, that's not okay. We need God to examine our hearts. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And so this prayer is, God, just show me. I can't be the one that's dealing with the sin in my own life. I need you to deal with it. Lead me in the way everlasting, which is like contrast to the wicked way. And so, in conclusion, a couple of thoughts for Psalm 139 in our lives. Number one, you are not alone. Hebrews 13, 5 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the God that we have. He will never leave us nor forsake us, no matter where we're at, no matter how far we've tried to run away. God is there. If there is nobody that understands you, nobody that gets you right now in your life and what you're going through, God does better than you. Pray to him. Number two is God will fulfill his purpose for you. And that's what we've seen in this psalm. The Lord has ordained the days in his book for you. Every step, every thing, every day. Psalm 138, verse 8 says this, The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. And that is the true and honest prayer of anyone who wants to follow the Lord. Lord, you have a purpose. I know you're going to fulfill it. I trust you. 
That's good to know. Psalm 139 reminds us of that. Another thing about one, Psalm 139 is how important it is to spend time with the Lord in your own life. Because Psalm 139 is very personal. If you don't get personal with God, if you don't spend time in prayer and in the word, then you're missing out on the most important thing in your relationship with him, and that is true intimacy. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your mind and all of your strength. And you see that in Psalm 139. Even if we try to run away, we still surrender. Even though we struggle, we still trust. And then lastly, that he is the hound of heaven. One version of this psalm puts the heading, the hound of heaven because you can never escape him. And I like that. Luke 19, verse 10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Isn't it good to know that God seeks you first? That the way it works with the gospel is you don't seek God first. Actually, we kind of hate him and we run away from him. But God seeks you first. And he comes to this earth and he demonstrates his love by dying on the cross first. He makes the first step and, and he even opens our eyes so we can see and understand the light of the gospel. He is the hound of heaven and you can never get away from him. And in his pursuit of you, Christ came to this earth and when he died on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He also cried out, Father, why have you forsaken me? Think of that moment where he felt alone because of your sin on him. In that moment, he was alone so that you would never have to be, ever. That is an amazing love. That is a God who pursues you, the hound of heaven that we see in Psalm 139. Let's bow our heads and pray. If you're in that place where you've been running from the Lord and you realize, wow, God, you love me and you died for me and you want to respond to him today, pray this prayer in your heart. Lord, Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying for me on the cross. I receive that gift of eternal life as I call upon your name, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. Save me. Thank you for pursuing us, Lord. Help us now to be those who are in pursuit of you, to follow you in all of your ways, the everlasting way. And Lord, for all of us, I pray that you establish in our hearts the awareness of your presence, your, your knowledge of us, your love for us, and your power that has been at work from before we were even born. All on behalf of us, Lord. May we glorify you in all that we are. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.